Hi, welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Shannon Elliott. Do you consider yourself normal? What does that word mean to you? Today I'm joined by two guests from the Exploratorium, a museum of science, art, and human perception in San Francisco. They're here to discuss an upcoming exhibit called The Changing Face of What is Normal. It analyzes how we define, categorize, and treat those who fall outside conceptions of normal behavior. Hugh McDonald is a project director and senior science writer at the Exploratorium. He's also the lead scientist for an initiative from the National Science Foundation to develop exhibits on human behavior. Prior to joining the museum, he was a psychology professor at San Diego State University. Pamela Winfrey is a senior artist at the Exploratorium. She has been with the museum for more than 30 years. She's curated performance series, exhibitions, artist residencies, and gallery installations. Welcome, Pam, and welcome, Hugh. Thank you so much for joining me Thank today. You. It's great to be here. Pam, can you tell us what prompted the idea for this new exhibit? Well, I guess the core of the whole thing started when I was visiting with my family. To I went to a museum called the Glore Museum. It's in St. Joseph's, Missouri, and it's actually a psychiatric museum. It has all of these artifacts from um, everywhere from about uh, the, maybe the, the 20s up, and then reproductions of antiquities, way, ways that people were dealing with people that had mental health issues. Um, and they had, um, they had a, 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 a Utica crib, which was a restraining device, a 19th century restraining device. Uh, and they had a mannequin within the crib. And um, we specialize at the Exploratorium in interactive exhibits. And so I was wondering what it would, I really thought about what, it's like, what would it be like to be in this coffin-shaped crib, um, unable to put your knees up, unable to turn around, turn over, and be in that, that place for days, if not weeks, and I don't know, maybe even years. But um, this concept of trying to put myself into that, into that cage uh, really made me start thinking about what an interactive exhibit is and what it could be. So we decided to develop one at the Exploratorium and try to see it's not a, so much about replicating that, what that experience is, it's because it, that's just an impossible thing. But to be able to try to get people to imagine, if you can put people in the imaginative state of thinking about what that might be like, maybe you could really think about what, what it would be like to be in that situation. And so that was the kernel of the whole thing. And then I started doing research and I ran across this, um, a traveling exhibition that was, that was, a, it was about these suitcases that had been discovered in um, an upstate um, mental facility called Willard. And in 1995, it had been, um, they were going to um, close it, and people were scrambling around trying to figure out, you know, what to do with all the objects. And somebody said, I think there might be something up in the attic. And so they pushed through the attic, and they found 427 suitcases that had been left behind, and most of them had never been, um, uh, the, the patients had no access to these suitcases. So if you can imagine what you would take with you, if you didn't know how long you were going to be gone, if you'd ever come back home, what you would bring with you. So I went and um, talked to Craig Williams, who's a historian at the New York State Museum, and he was the one that was on site. They called him when they found all these suitcases. And they called him and they said, okay, well, you should take maybe 10 of them. And he took all 427 of them. So he's sort of the, the hero of the whole, whole project. Um, and anyway, so those, I went and saw those objects, and those objects are so normal. They are just absolutely what anybody might want to take. Um, and so that was sort of the, um, the, the heart of the whole thing. And then I was researching about the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is the reference that most clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists use to determine um, uh, d different kinds of psychological conditions, and I realized that the, the fifth edition was actually going to be published in May of 2013, about a month after we opened. So there was this confluence of things. So those three areas are um, what we're really exploring, and I should, I should turn to, um, to Hugh to talk a little bit more about the DSM because that's, that's where the intellectual core of the whole thing is. So Hugh, what is the DSM? What does it stand for? Well, the full title is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, and it's published by the American Psychiatric Association. It's essentially a diagnosis manual, so it lists symptoms and it allows clinicians to look at those symptoms and how long someone has been exhibiting them or, or suffering from them and, and be able to say, that means that this person is likely to be diagnosed with this, this problem. And, it, and it's essentially a standardization guide, so that if, if I come to you as a clinician in one state with a certain set of symptoms, you're going to give me the same diagnosis as if Pam went to a clinician in another state with the same symptoms. So the goal is to, uh, to standardize the language and the diagnosis of, of particular sets of behaviors. 
and um, many, uh, it, it also opens the door to treatment. So once you've been, uh, gotten a code for a particular diagnosis, that allows some, an insurance company to bill for your treatment, it allows you to be treated. So it's not only a manual of uh, information about the disorders, but it's, a, uh, it's an insurance company gateway to being, to being able to be treated for the problems that you come in with. So I know there's multiple versions of the DSM, and they've changed over time. How many versions are there, and how has the manual evolved? Well, there's been, there's been five major revisions. Uh, the one that's coming out in May uh, 2013 is the DSM-5. And uh, it certainly has gotten a lot bigger, uh, but it's also gotten a lot more nuanced. There's a lot more information about uh, the particular disorders or particular sets of uh, behaviors that constitute disorders over time. Uh, there's a lot more information about who, uh, who suffers, which kinds of uh, populations suffer from which kinds of things more than others. Um, so it's, it's, research has been going on. Uh, in clini clinical settings for all that time, and that's all been incorporated into the DSM. So the DSM is a really controversial thing. You have different perspectives from pr providers, people with mental health issues, insurance companies, et cetera. Have you found in your experience, um, particularly with this exhibit maybe beforehand, are there some people with mental health issues out there who actually like the DSM, who like being having a certain categorization, or is it, you know, completely anti-DSM? Anti oh, no, there's a, one, one, of the interesting, one, one of the interesting things that you discover is um, imagine somebody who's been suffering with somebody, not suffer, suffering with something that they, that they uh, didn't know other people had, didn't know that it had a name, didn't know that clinicians were aware of it, and then to discover, oh, yes, we know what this is. Other people have this. You're not alone. And, in fact, there's a treatment for this. That can actually be a great relief for people. Um, but again, the, the other side of the coin is, is something, if something is, is normal and isn't hurting somebody, what's the, what's the value of actually assigning a, uh, assigning a diagnosis to it and then opening somebody up for treatment for that thing? Right. And how much risk is there in labeling people? Exactly. And, and labels follow you. Stigma follows you, right? especially today. So can you guys give us an overview of the exhibit? What are the guests going to experience? What are the components? Well, um, the biggest part of it is actually this um, a, a bit of a replica of what it would be like to come into this attic. So you, um, it's, it's an environment and it's really designed to sort of encourage that if you've ever had that opportunity, especially as kids going up in the grandma's attic and being sure. able to open drawers and things like that, it has that sense of discovery. Um, we're trying to protect the objects and yet make them as accessible as possible. So we're using wire mesh instead of um, uh, any kind of uh, you know, shielding. Um, and then you're able to pull open drawers and sort of look around because really the, 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 the hidden um, curatorial lens that may, not, may or may not be um, apparent in terms of how we talk about it is really about, about it could happen to you, it could be you. Right. Luck of the draw. Yeah, right. luck of the draw and that, it, that, it, that, that everybody has the paths that they're walking and right. things happen. Right. These people are just like me. Yeah, right. yeah. These are just books and photographs, the same things I would have taken. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing about, like, sometimes you, like, you look at these, these suitcases, like there's one of the suitcases just has, somebody was very stripped down in terms of what he brought with him. He, you know, he had two pairs of shoes, he had two um, uh, shaving mugs and two shaving brushes and just in two pairs of pants and two pairs of shirts. And then you'd have people that had, you know, spoke five languages and have huge libraries and... Mm -hmm. Musical uh, instruments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think also it's, um, it's a way to really talk about how things have been shifting. There's a continuum of, uh, you know, it's such a complex thing. I mean, humans are complex. The mind, the human mind is really complex. And I think a lot of it, too, is about that struggle to try to understand what, how, do, how, do, how do you deal with this? You know, how do you, how do you humanely and humanly deal with this? And I think Willard, it's interesting because now Willard is seen as this. I mean, it was called the, what was it, the... Willard Asylum, and it, you know, it had the word asylum in it. And back in those days, it was 18, I want to say 79, Something around there, like um, when it was when they they first started accepting people. And it was this incredible. Um, it was seen as an incredible step up. I mean, Dorothea Dix and people like that were were roaming around and they were looking at how people were treated, and they were treated terribly. There was no place for them. They were in jail. They were in debtors' prisons. You know, they were they were just treated abominably. So the first people that came, um, like one guy came in a chicken coop, and he was so, he'd been in there for so long, he couldn't use his legs forevermore. And then you have, you have all of these, you know, you have all of these different um, uh, developments, technological developments. I mean, 
um, that really changed the way that the care was, but it was also about community. One of the big differences between this show and the show that was previous, it's, it has many more of the artifacts, but mm -hmm. I think more importantly, it has the caregiver's voice. Um, there was a book that was the um, that came out. It was called "The Lives They Left Behind," and it really centered on the objects. Um, but the caregivers at Willard were really wanted to talk about what their lives were like at Willard. And so, um, Karen Miller, who is a psychiatrist and poet, um, uh, Craig in introduced me to her, and then it turned out that she was in the middle of this big project, and she got access to the records, which is a very tough thing to do because if you if you know about mental health. Um, policy in the United States, you, your, your um, records are sealed in perpetuity, and it's very, very difficult to get access to that. But that was, turned out to be an essential part of this whole thing because it turns out that once you look at people's records, you find out that they had, you know, they were gay. That was one of the, that was, people were put into these places if they were not. In those times, that was not a norm, seen as normal. Mm -hmm. So that's that's part of the shifting change in right. this investigation. In fact, change is a, it changes really to me the, the key element here. You think about this word asylum, right? Now it, it sparks fear and, and it's it's this horrible place. Nobody wants to go to an asylum. But but remember that asylum also means a place of peace. It's a place of mm -hmm. refuge, right? Mm -hmm. And when that when when the, it was first put together, this was a place that was intended to help these people who were not being treated well in other contexts. So back then asylum was a was a, a wonderful thing, right? You were going away from being in prison for behavior you couldn't necessarily control. Right. Oh. So the exhibit is going to have a Utica crib, mm -hmm. and we have the suitcases. And I know there's a third component with people telling their own stories, people with mental health issues on camera sharing their stories with visitors. Um, tell me a little bit about that, and what kind of stories are we going to see? You want to tackle that one? Well, uh, that's, that centers around the, the DSM piece. Essentially, we have I mean, uh, presenting uh, something that's essentially a book a textbook in, a, in an interactive museum environment is a challenge, right? How do you actually Absolutely. make this interesting? So, uh, and how do you actually uh, convey the nuance and the depth of this? So the idea is that there will be six um, monitors with people on them with six different perspectives on what the DSM and what the idea of normal has meant to them. Three of them are, uh, are clinicians or caregivers and three of them are people who've, mm -hmm. who've uh, been diagnosed with something or who have been treated for something that's, that's in the DSM. Or, and they have very different views on whether this has been helping them, has, has been hurting them, what the controversy is about. So visitors will see that not only that the book itself has changed, but that there are these uh, this range of viewpoints on the books. And Piers, incidentally, was instrumental in terms of us right. being able to locate the folks that were um, had particularly interesting stories. So there's five versions of the DSM, mm -hmm. each one gradually thicker than the previous. Right. So how has that book changed over time? Well, in a number of ways. I mean, the most obvious one is is that uh, the descriptions have gotten more nuanced and more detailed for for individual. Uh, diagnoses. Um, the, the DSM doesn't have anything about treatments in it, so it's so a lot of people think that it's a, it's it's more about what the treatments are. It's mm -hmm. not the case. It's that the uh, the method for classifying and identifying mental mental disorders has gotten more complex over time. Um, additionally, some things have been added. A number of things uh, that weren't seen as as diagnosable conditions early on are in there now. But the reverse is also true. There are things that were in there at the beginning that have either been eliminated or uh, the diagnosis have changed in various ways. So um, the, the worry of, of, of that it's just getting bigger, that often is seen as this uh, example that more things are, are being pathologized and that's therefore bad. It's, it's actually more complicated than that. So. I mean, they're dealing with gender, you know, like they'll, they'll, they'll talk about whether it's, it, it affects men or women, whether it affects kids or if you're right. older. I mean, it right. really details a lot of it out right. part in of, a way that doesn't. Right. Well, part of why it's, it's, gotten, it's gotten bigger is that research has been going on and more is learned about many of these disorders and the ways that they operate and who, ha who has them under what conditions. So again, this is for clinicians to provide clinicians information to understand what it is they're seeing and to be able to talk to each other and say, this is what I saw in this patient here. What did you see in that, that client? There. I mean, it started, in, it was 52 was the first one, and so um, after the war, they, people were seeing a lot of different kinds of conditions, mm -hmm. and so they, but they couldn't talk to each other, so there'd be, you know, a doctor in Boston and a doctor in San Francisco, they were seeing the same things, but they had no language for it, so part of it was to be able to get a common language going, but also to be able to create some statistics, oh my goodness, you know, like 5% of the people coming back from the wars have got this thing. Right. Um, but I, I do think it's very controversial. I, 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 uh, it's been interesting to talk and educate myself about all these different viewpoints. I've, I'm fascinated by 
how the psychologists and psychiatrists are also not at all a united front. I mean, they're, they're really challenging themselves in terms of, of what's included and what's not included and how do we talk about this stuff. It's, it's definitely not a monolithic mm -hmm. uh, block. They're just as concerned with issues of, of over-labeling or over-pathologizing normal behavior as, as people who aren't uh, in, the, in the therapeutic professions. Um, they're also they're trying to make something that works. That's really the overriding goal. That that doesn't mean that the worries of people of uh, that that things are being over pathologized or, or that the, the nuance of any individual uh, person's situation is being kind of masked by a kind of one size fits all approach. Those are very valid concerns. But um, there, there's definitely an ongoing discussion. So how have both your views on what constitutes normal and a mental illness changed since you began work on this exhibit? Well, one thing that's changed is, a, is an awareness of uh, the, the nuance associated with that question. That, uh, that, that term, normal, it seems so sort of bland, but it's so rich in terms of meaning across, across populations and across people. So, uh, and, it, and it's very powerful, right? I mean, who, who doesn't worry sometimes whether they're normal? On the other hand, who doesn't want to be to break out from normal? Normal has this wonderful uh, but problematic sense of being both a, a good thing and a and a dull thing, right? And you want to figure out where do you fit on the spectrum. So um, a lot of it has been uh, looking at the people who've been talking about that concept and how it applies to them, and really understanding the power that it has in their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, we had to really think about whether we wanted to use that term because it is such a loaded term, Absolutely. for better or worse. Um, but what's been interesting to me is, um, in my research, I've, I've realized how uh, we seem to be kind of obsessed by um, whether we're normal or not. So there is a, there's a website that you can go, there's, a, there's an iPhone mm -hmm. app about am I normal, and it seems to be a lot of teens are involved in that. Mm -hmm. You know, is it normal for me to feel this, and normal for, for me to feel that? Um, there was a Pulitzer Prize winning musical, uh, um, I think it's called Next to Normal. I mean, and it turns out there's, I don't know, there's 36 books off the bat that use normal in their titles. Mm -hmm. And I think also that San Francisco has a special relationship to normal because I think a lot of people here do not want to be thought of as normal and, and, the, and our city is not thought of as normal. And so it's, all, it's, a, very, it's a very interesting term and well, we're sort of, we had to think about whether we wanted to retain that, that, um, that word in the title. Well, and it's, it's also that, I mean, it, it points out this idea that as humans, we're, we're intensely social, right? So one of the things we're very aware of all the time is, how does my behavior compare with the behavior of those around me? And then there's, once you're aware of, of whether it fits or doesn't fit, then the question becomes, is that okay with me or not? And is it okay with the rest of society? Are they okay with me not fitting? And if they're not, what do I do about that? I mean, that brings up the, the, the thought that the, um, the normal show is actually embedded in a larger gallery called the West Gallery. And Hugh and I are co-curating this space, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of a sea change for the Exploratorium to take this on in such a big, a big way, but we're basically looking at human phenomena. I mean, how do we behave? How do we think? How do we learn? Um, and we've certainly explored this in a lot of different ways under, per, under the rubric of perception, but now we're really investigating this in a bigger, in a bigger way. So that's interesting. I'd like to learn more about that because the Exploratorium has traditionally focused on natural sciences, physical sciences, things that come, one plus one equals two, there's things without judgment. So how is this being received and why did the Exploratorium decide to go in this new innovative direction? Well, it's, it's interesting. We've always been, uh, you know, our founder was aware, Frank Oppenheimer was aware of the, of the importance of of not just looking at the outside world, but of how we perceive it. So there's, there's one sense in which perception has always been a thread that runs through our work. Um, but it, it is definitely a, a move, a strong move in the direction of the social sciences and, and essentially saying the exhibit is not some phenomena that's outside of you. It, the exhibit is you, and it's the space between you and other people. It's how you two use that space. So um, there is a lot of um, discussion about how do we shift visitors' attention from the outside world to themselves? What are the risks and benefits of that? Is that fun? Is that enjoyable? How do we make it so? What, do we, what, are we, uh, what is our response and our responsibility when we bring up issues that might be uncomfortable for people? Well, my behavior doesn't fit with, with everybody else. Is that okay with me? Um, so really the challenge for us is to make a safe place to experiment with those things just as we've done with all sorts of other things. We, we made a safe place for people to experiment with electricity and fire and chemicals 
Now we want to make a safe place where people can actually experiment with their own behavior, their own thoughts and feelings. I think the other part of that is, for me, I, I think the museum has been really good at, at saying, you know, we have an optic nerve, and that means that we have a blind spot on the back of our eyes. So we all see alike. Physiologically, we all see alike. I think this is a new, a new stage where we're actually going, well, physiologically, we might all see alike, I mean, generally. Um, but then there's all these different things that are starting to come up, like we actually don't see all alike right. because of where we were raised you know, um, who our parents were, all the, all the things that go into making us who we are as individuals and as groups. I think also that um, uh, the National Science Foundation um, gave us a grant on the science of sharing, which Hugh is part of and um, actually is running it. Um, but I think that they're starting to recognize that it's not enough to just educate, educate people about science. So global warming, climate mm -hmm. change, they've been giving a lot of money to those to those topics, but people haven't changed their behavior. So I think there's a recognition mm -hmm. that we have to really start thinking about what what makes people act the way that they do? Why do they do these things? And I think right. that that's also, I think um, that's a beautiful wedding of what used to be called the hard sciences and the soft sciences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, one of the issues that the, those big problems share, I mean, that there are technological solutions to things like global warming or resource depletion. But at heart, those are problems of human behavior, of human trust and cooperation. So those, understanding how those work and what science can tell us about how humans interact and how they perceive each other is just as important as understanding the technology involved in cutting greenhouse gas emissions, for example. So why did you choose to feature people with mental health issues in addition to clinicians in this exhibit? Well, I think one of the one of the phrases that that is that we've been hearing a lot is is, is nothing about us without us, right? And so the idea of uh, you know, understanding that we all have different perspectives really sort of shines a light on the idea that our views on how this works are not the only views out there, and there 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 are other people who experience the same topics that we're talking about in very different ways. And the show, the exhibition, the museum would be incomplete unless you had a lot of a lot of viewpoints on it. In fact, I, uh, one of my favorite taglines of the Exploratorium is that we're a community museum dedicated to awareness. And the idea of awareness means that it's not just mine, it's ours. It's how does yours differ from mine? Yeah. I want, there's one other thing that I, I want to make sure I don't neglect to talk about, too, which is that um, the, the show also ex is going to include John Crispin's photographs. He's a photographer, um, East Coast, and he... He had also been working with Karen, the psychiatric or psychologist um, poet. We're going to be featuring his photographs, and they're really lovely photographs mm -hmm. of the uh, of the artifacts as well as Karen's poems. So you'll have a very uh, a variety of disciplines with which to view this this exhibition too. Yeah, it's it's worth saying that um, the exhibition is not is not intended to be a comprehensive view of the concept of normal or, or uh, the nature of mental health or to indict or support any particular therapeutic approach. It's really designed, like everything we do, to prompt the public to, to question things that they had taken for granted before. So they walk in with a particular view of normal or mental health and the idea is to say, where did that, where did that come from and is that all there is to it and here's a different way that you might want to think about it. So it, it isn't attempting to, to, to tell the whole story. It's attempting to get visitors to think about the story and explore it on their own. And actually, one of the um, areas that we haven't really talked about is that there'll be a, there'll be a large area where people can actually will ask cogent questions, and um, people will be able to respond and put their responses up. So that'll be a big part of the exhibition itself is, I think, giving voices, you know, having um, the opportunity to hear a lot of people weigh in on this topic uh, is important, actually critical. That's one of the other things that I found when I've been um, in, involved in this is that is that everybody's lives are touched by this topic. It is it it is it is as ubiquitous as milk. You know, it really is. It's everywhere and almost I, I don't know that I have found one person who doesn't think strongly or intensely or have some personal story about it. It's also just it's also very dynamic too. I mean, even as simple as, as going to another state you discover that the views just a few miles away about what, what constitutes normal behavior are different. And of course, that's magnified when you go to another country. Things that are completely normal and unremarkable here are radically unusual in another place. Um, I think one of the other overall goals is understanding not only that we differ on those things, but providing an opportunity to differ civilly and, and generatively, right? We, 
I would, I would say we're in a, in a place in many areas right now where civil disagreement is not necessarily the most common thing that happens. And what we want to do is give people an opportunity to understand it's okay if there's a difference here. Let's explore it. Let's not set up barriers bet between us because of it. Also, um, this is just one, this is the first segment. There's another segment, um, which will be the changing phase of what is normal in terms of society. Mm -hmm. So we'll have an opportunity to, to extend that concept of normal um, outside the realms of mental health. If this exhibit is successful, what does that look like? Well, for me, if people can uh, have a bit of a sea change in terms of saying, those are those people and I am me, if they can understand that there's more of a, 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 an exchange and a, sort of a, a, it's just the luck of the draw sometimes about what happens to people, and if they can really fit themselves into those other shoes, that would be real good. I totally agree. Uh, another, maybe another way of saying that is, um, uh, for me, people leaving an exhibit or an exhibition and saying, I never thought about it that way before. Um, I might not uh, know everything there is to know about it, but now I'm really interested in it. Now I want to keep exploring it on my own. To me, that's a successful exhibition. And here, the idea is, I never thought about normality or the way I was similar to or different from other people before, or at least not at this level of detail. And now I want to think about it a little bit more. That's a success. And lastly, when can we see this exhibit? When does it debut? April 17th with the rest of the, with the, rest of the Exploratorium. Right. And it runs for the first uh, for, runs for, 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 a year. for the first year. So you have a year to check yeah. it out. And we'll be doing a lot of programming in the fall that um, will be uh, correlative and we'll be able to grapple with some of these issues. Right. Well, thank you so much, Pam, and thank you so much, Hugh. You. I cannot wait thank to you. see it in April. Thank you. To stay updated on information about the museum and its new location, visit the Exploratorium website at exploratorium.edu. To learn more about the suitcases from Willard Psychiatric Center in New York, read The Lives They Left Behind, Suitcases from a State Hospital Attic by Darby Penny and Peter Stastny. To see some of the Willard suitcases in an online exhibit, visit suitcaseexhibit.org. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.